thank you, Bertel, and thank you for the uh, invitation to uh, to talk about Taiwan. I always accept an invitation to talk about Taiwan, as as Clemens uh, well know, being my supervisor back uh, 25 years. This was actually where I started my work on on Asia, uh, doing. Uh, uh, an analysis when I was still at university on uh, the Taiwan Strait crisis in the mid 1990s. So uh, this has really been my my focus uh, uh, ever since following this uh, the developments in the in the Taiwan Strait. So what I was asked to do and what I decided uh, with battle to, that we would do here was kind of to do an uh, an assessment of the security situation in the Taiwan Strait, uh, something on the military uh, developments in the Taiwan Strait. And my main argument is that we have seen, uh, we see, uh, and this is also the title, we see a new normal uh, in the Taiwan Strait following the, the visit by, by Nancy Pelosi in early August. So I'll of course say uh, more about uh, what is characterizing this uh, new normal. But I'd like to start by taking a, a step back uh, and seeing kind of the broader uh, security situation in, in the region. So what is it we are seeing? What is kind of the context that we need to uh, to think in? And, and this is because my main argument is that um, this crisis in, in early August was caused uh, by Nancy Pelosi, but it would have come anyway, because developments are simply uh, going in the direction of more and more of growing tension of a military buildup uh, in and around the Taiwan Strait. Uh, and due to the, as I will uh, elaborate on uh, uh, shortly, due to the, the, the really deteriorating uh, relations between the US and, and China, uh, it's very, very difficult to manage these uh, complex and delicate balances that we've always had uh, in the Taiwan Strait. So if we start taking this uh, step back, looking at, at China, China's development uh, uh, and the development in Chinese uh, foreign and security policy, we, uh, in, in the debate on China, we have a, a lot of agreement on that, that, um, that China is going away from this uh, Taiwan Yanghui, no longer keeping a, a low profile, is moving away, is, is more assertive, more, more uh, con confident. Uh, and this is true. Uh, China wants uh, this great power status, this great power influence. But to be uh, secure in your own neighborhood is a precondition for that. So you can't really step out as a global great power before you have a stable uh, neighborhood. And this is still a challenge uh, for China. Um, if you want to project military power further away from the Chinese territory, further out, uh, also outside Asia, you need to be in control in your near neighborhood. And this is still uh, a challenge for, for, for China. So China needs to secure a stable and relatively accommodating neighborhood first. Uh, so my main point here is that if we look at this map uh, of China, we know that they still, have, we know that they have a lot of neighbors. 14 by land, more by sea. Uh, they have still some challenges, uh, still some uh, challenges in their relations with several uh, of these neighbors. Um, but of course, Taiwan is, is uh, the main issue. So my point here is that, um, that China still is very much, has still has a regional focus. So even though we talk more and more about China now stepping up as a great power, if we look at its uh, security policy, its military development, its military modernization, it very much still has a regional focus because China is still challenged in its neighborhood. Um, and what is key for, for China looking at, at its uh, security policy, looking at its military uh, development, is uh, to ensure that China is the dumb dominant uh, power has control within what we call the first island chain. This is what you can see, uh, the, 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 blue, uh, the blue line here uh, on the map is the first uh, island chain, what is also very um, uh, dominant in the Chinese military strategic thinking uh, on these uh, island chains. So this is uh, key for, uh, key for uh, uh, China. And of course, uh, Taiwan is within the first uh, island chain. Uh, so it is uh, therefore key for, for China also in a, in a military strategic sense to have control over this, uh, this area. To establish what we call a regional anti-access area denial bubble. 
Uh, and this is simply that it's the Chinese military that is con in control within the first island chain. So they can, they can make it risky and potentially very costly for the US um, and the US allies to deploy uh, military forces close to, uh, to Chinese territory. And of course, as relations between China and, and the US uh, worsen, this becomes even more crucial for China to be able to have this, uh, this control. Uh, we could talk for long about what the US uh, is doing these years in the region, Quad, AUKUS, uh, uh, strengthening its bilateral uh, uh, alliances, more strategic partnership. Of course, all that seen from China is very challenging, threatening, and therefore it becomes more urgent for them to establish uh, this control. Uh, they see it as a US encirclement, containment, and want to uh, have this uh, uh, A2AD uh, cap capability. If we, um, yeah, so this, I guess, was the, the, the main point here. And then just a little bit on how I see U.S.-China relation, because I think it's, it's, it's really key to, to the things we are discussing today. There is, I guess, by now a general uh, agreement that U.S.-China relations are at the worst stage uh, since the establishment, establishment of diplomatic relations in, in the 1970s. They both, they see each other as, uh, as rivals, as threats. There are declining uh, trust, very little dialogue. And that means that we are back to public messaging, uh, military signals, um, uh, for example, sending Chinese uh, uh, fighters into uh, Taiwan's uh, air identification zone, um, our air defense identification zone to signal Chinese uh, anger, protest warnings, uh, or the U.S. sending their, uh, their uh, ships uh, up in the Taiwan Strait also to signal to China that they are still there. So a lot of public messaging and, and military signals. We've seen that growing over uh, several years, but of course we really saw it very clearly during the crisis uh, in early August. Um, so my point here is that the recent military developments and recent, I mean, over the, the last few years, it, it, it reflects um, developments or the temperature, you could say, in US-China relations more than anything else. So it doesn't really reflect that China is losing patience or want to take Taiwan and, and all these things. It more than anything else reflects that the, that relationship, the relationship between the US and China is, is really at a low point. Um, and I'd like to elaborate uh, a bit on that because the point here uh, is that there's always been these very delicate and complex balances in the Taiwan Strait. Um, it's always kind of been the US-China relations that set the overall frame uh, and conditions for developments uh, in the Taiwan Strait. So, so this is not new, but the new thing is that uh, that because the mutual mistrust is, is so high and, and dialogue almost non-existence between uh, Beijing and, and Washington, this common management of these delicate and complex uh, balances um, that has kept stability in the Taiwan Strait since the, uh, since the end of the 1970s uh, is weakening and the situation is, is destabilizing. So, so this is what we've seen over, over the recent years. Both sides are, and we see that every time Biden goes out and says something that the administration is not very uh, um, happy about, or at least maybe wasn't really uh, in on, or maybe there were, we can get back to whether it's strategic communication. But every time we see that they go back out and say, well, we haven't changed our one China policy. And we also see Chinese high level diplomats being out reassuring at the same time as they are sending these political and military uh, signals. So my point here is, as I, as I write, that we actually see both sides seeking to restabilize the situation while also increasingly expecting and preparing for a worst case scenario. So, so this is why we see these mixing signals uh, uh, from both sides. Uh, and the worst case scenario seen from Washington and Taipei is that Beijing will use a military force uh, to, to unify or to force through this reunification or unification, whatever we, we, which side we see it from. 
um, and seen from Beijing that Washington will scrap, the, will, will go away from the one China uh, policy, will recognize Taiwan as an independent state, or that tai Taipei declares independence with US encouragement or support. So these are kind of the worst case scenarios seen from both sides. And, and both sides are preparing to, to, to deal with it, seeing it as a more and more realistic development that we are going in, in that direction. So that means that the result is that we have a more, we still have a kind of a stability in the Taiwan Strait, but it's always, and it's always been a very fragile stability. It's always been going up and down, but now it's going higher up every time. Uh, that we have uh, a, a crisis. So we have higher tension every time there's a crisis. Um, and, uh, and, and, you, and, and the problem also is that the mechanism for managing tensions uh, are collapsing, uh, especially this crisis in early August had that uh, effect. Um, so, um, so this is, uh, this is uh, also the, uh, the, uh, the, the situation. I think if we ask all, uh, if we ask in, in Beijing, in Taipei, in, in, in Washington, all will kind of agree that status quo is acceptable somehow. But the problem is they don't agree on what status quo actually is and all see a development uh, in, the, in the status quo and all see the other side as actually moving away from, from status quo. And as long as they do not talk uh, with each other, it's this public of uh, a public signaling military signals that are that are um, that are influencing running the driving the the, the the dynamics in the strait and then we have these really well-known security dilemma dynamics where you always react to the other one because you feel you see the other one as the assertive one or the aggressive one so you are uh, um, uh, preparing for that and this is a very uh, dangerous uh, development. So uh, I also think it's important to stress because often we try to compare what is happening in the South China Sea and the East China Sea uh, with what is happening in the Taiwan Strait. And I think we should be very careful with that because the triangle uh, US, um, China, US, Taiwan relation, they somehow operate according to their own logic. And we simply have to take the whole historical context into account there in order to understand how they uh, how they uh, how they operate. So it's important to analyze the conflict in the Taiwan Strait uh, in its own historical uh, context, including, of course, the importance of the Taiwan issue for the Communist Party's regime legitimacy and also the importance of the Taiwan issue in uh, US-China relations. Um, so it's not the same as the Chinese claims in the South China Sea or the East China Sea. Um, but what is happening still, I think, in recent years is that both, um, uh, both uh, Beijing and Washington increasingly approach the Taiwan conflict looking through this prism of uh, overall US-China rivalry. Uh, and this is part of the problem uh, uh, because they have their own uh, ends, their own priorities, uh, which is more to do with this rivalry between the US and China than to do with securing Taiwan in or, or helping uh, securing Taiwan, if we see it from, from a US point of, 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 of view. Good, so I think this was uh, maybe enough of kind of an introduction to, to the uh, regional security situation, to the situation in, in the Taiwan Strait, just kind of before we even get to, uh, to, to the most recent uh, crisis. So if we then just uh, look at uh, it from each, uh, each uh, side, starting with, with China, why is uh, Taiwan, I most often ask, why is so Taiwan so important uh, seen from China? And I think, of course, it is seen as this uh, last outstanding uh, issue from the 100 years, uh, what they call the 100 years of humiliation. It's this unfinished uh, uh, civil war. Uh, and, and then it got tangled up in the Cold War dynamics and, 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 uh, and uh, what I call the domestic experiments uh, uh, under Mao with the Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution. It wasn't really on top of, uh, of uh, the agenda, but then uh, it became uh, even more so after Tiananmen in, in 89 that this Chinese nationalism uh, and uh, this about Taiwan being the last outstanding from the 100 years of, uh, of, uh, of humiliation. 
So there are several things uh, that point to uh, Taiwan being a, what we sometimes call a core interest uh, for, for uh, the Communist Party. Um, and, uh, and I could go through more of this if there's any interest on how the, the history leads up to, uh, to, to this. Uh, but I think the key to take away from, from this is that, the, that it, is, it plays into to the Communist Party's regime legitimacy, but I don't see any fixed timeline. If you follow the debate now, uh, there is a lot of, of yeah, debate about whether the, the Xi Jinping has set a fixed timeline. Uh, and I, don't, I, I, I can't find that anywhere in any speeches and any, any statements. They talk about this uh, uh, reunification by 2049. And of course, uh, in a lot of the speeches, they're thinking that there should be a, a Taiwan should come back to, uh, to China. But that doesn't really specify how the relationship between uh, China and Taiwan should be. Um, so, it's just to say, I, I don't see the fixed timeline. And as I said before, I don't see the Chinese running, uh, patient running out, that they're more eager to force through uh, uh, unif reunification. Good. Um, so the problem is, uh, for, or the, the central thing for the Communist Party is to keep what I call the reunification window open. Uh, so what they are, uh, uh, very much fearing and what they are seeing, and we'll come back to some of the more recent developments in China and US policy, is that the US is gradually moving away from their one China policy. Uh, and that they also see a development in Taiwan where forces uh, arguing or, or pushing for Taiwanese independence are growing. And this is a huge uh, uh, concern, of course, for, for the Chinese. And this is very much what they are trying to push back on. So it's very much kind of a process analysis seen from Beijing. As long as the window is kept open and, and hopefully the window opens more and more, but it can't go the other way. It can't start closing. And this is seen from them, unfortunately, what they've seen uh, in recent years. And now they're reacting very uh, strongly uh, towards that. So the view from Taiwan, a few things, uh, we could also talk about that. I remember when I was uh, here, uh, um, uh, here uh, at, at, at political science, I had a whole seminar on the Taiwan, on Taiwan politics. And, 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 and it is a fascinating uh, uh, story, the whole development from, from the end of the Civil War at, until uh, now. But I think what is important to take uh, away from here is really that on Taiwan, we don't see uh, coming with the democratization in the 1980s. Uh, there is a development of moving away from uh, this one China um, perception. Uh, there is more of a development of what I've here called one China, uh, one, China, one Taiwan. Uh, and I think even uh, the DPP uh, sometimes uses that expression uh, as well. Um, so moving away from this that we had, had under the KMT, uh, that there was uh, also uh, uh, understanding of one China. So this democratization was really a, a game changer. We see uh, ethnic Taiwanese gaining uh, uh, political positions. Uh, uh, the DPP, of course, uh, uh, becoming the, 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 the ruling party, um, as they are now, uh, or as they, they are now, yeah. Uh, so. So, uh, so the, 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 the mood, you could say, in Taiwan also is that there is very little trust uh, and very little support for anything one China or one China, two systems. Um, and this is, of course, very important, especially among if we look at how it is among the younger generation growing up in Taiwan that has no really feel no connections to, to the mainland. Uh, and this is, of course, part of the problem, uh, especially also uh, when they've seen what's happening in Hong Kong, that have kind of eroded any trust in the one country, two systems uh, model uh, in Taiwan. Um, what we have now in, in Taiwan uh, is uh, uh, the DPP uh, play a more and more dominant role, again, being more pro or at least not pro-independence necessarily, but at least not supportive of, uh, of any uh, accommodation uh, with, with uh, uh, China under the current situation. We have a very weak uh, KMT, the Kuomintang uh, party uh, is, is quite weak, haven't really recovered 
uh, from the recent uh, elections. Uh, as I mentioned, very little support among the younger generations. Um, and uh, I don't know how much we... Um, I think my main point here is uh, that a lot of what I'll return to that the Chinese are doing, trying to influence uh, political developments uh, in Taiwan, actually have very little success because we have a very strong democracy uh, in Taiwan and a democracy that is very... Uh, very aware of the threats it's facing and very um, um, able to, um, to push back. Uh, so I, I've, I've been to Taiwan several times and I'm so uh, surprised every time on how aware they are of dealing with these, what we could call disinformation uh, influence campaigns. Uh, we see very commercialized Taiwanese media. A lot of it is supported by Chinese uh, businesses, by Chinese uh, uh, government. But still, uh, I find a, a really stable, strong uh, democracy able to, to push back. But of course, this is, uh, this is something we can return to discuss whether this can, uh, this can continue. The current president, Tsai Ing-wen, has been uh, uh, the president since 2016. Uh, she's presented a very steady, stable line. She's not compromised. She's rejected acknowledging the, the 92 consensus. Uh, uh, but she's still not, she's still being very careful, not really rocking the boat. I, I think that was also what we've seen, uh, what we saw in the, in the most recent uh, crisis. Um, I took this picture with uh, Tsai Ing-wen in a military uniform because this is actually a really new development that you see uh, Taiwanese political leaders uh, connecting more strongly to the Taiwanese military. Traditionally, the, Chinese, the, the Taiwanese military has been more a KMT thing because it came with the Kuomintang from the mainland. Uh, but now we are seeing much more of, uh, of an effort to try to drag it in, and you could say, uh, and, and building uh, uh, ties. And I've at least uh, never seen a, a, a DPP leader before dressing all up in, in military gear. So this is also, uh, an indication of how uh, the Taiwanese military is getting more uh, focus and getting uh, stronger, uh, bigger uh, budgets. So the view from, from the US, I think, uh, is, uh, is even more interesting. I, I, I apologize for all the things here, but I think it's important sometimes because uh, <laughs> uh, the, the US-Taiwan policy is really complex. It is a mix of a lot of different things, and it has a long history. I mean, if we don't understand that, it's really, really difficult to understand the developments in the Taiwan Strait and why Biden saying, you know, we are, we are uh, committed to defending Taiwan can really cause a lot of uh, uh, concern. So if we look at it, um, Taiwan has gone from being this uh, unsinkable aircraft carrier uh, in the beginning of the Korean War at that time, remember, we didn't have, uh, we had the KMT on Taiwan, no democracy, no nothing, but it was an important ally. It was in the U.S. interest to have relations with the, the Repu Republic of China uh, uh, on Taiwan. So, uh, but then, of course, it has changed uh, with the democratization on Taiwan. So now it is more this, uh, at least under the Biden administration, it is more having Taiwan as an important partner, uh, I call it ally here, but uh, that is of course taking it too far, but it is uh, going, uh, uh, has some resemblance to that in this uh, democracy versus authoritarianism confrontation that the Biden administration is, is focusing on. So in that way, this about defending Taiwan or at least preventing Ta China from using military force to, uh, to, to, uh, 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 to, uh, uh, to reunify. Well, this has become a, a question about U.S. credibility as well. Even though sometimes they maybe wish in Washington it wasn't so, but it has become, and they're kind of being caught up in their own uh, uh, talk about this democratization versus authoritarianism uh, confrontation. Um, so the U.S. policy towards Taiwan, this complex set of uh, agreements, domestic laws and promises, uh, <laughs> President Biden, he actually, and I think this was uh, uh, acknowledgement of how complex it is that he just referred to it as the Taiwan Agreement. 
uh, all these things that play into it. There's nothing called the Taiwan Agreement, but it was kind of how he referred to it because there are so many things playing into it. So I mentioned some of the most important things here, of course, the one China policy, which is the result of the normalization of diplomatic relations between the US and China uh, in, the, in the 1970s, the three communiques. Uh, so there they have kind of have this one China policy, one China principle. There's also uh, uh, different uh, ways of, of framing it or, or naming it. Uh, the US call it uh, the one China policy, the, the Chinese call it the one China principle. Uh, and, the, and the difference is that the US say that they acknowledge there is one China, uh, but they don't acknowledge <laughs> that, uh, that Taiwan is a part of China in that one China policy, where of course the Chinese uh, uh, hold that the US have also acknowledged that Taiwan is a part of China. So there is uh, this, but this is the one China policy. Um, but then there's also the Taiwan Relation Act which is actually a, a domestic US law forced through by Congress uh, in the late 1970s because they were somewhat frustrated. Again, remember no democracy at this time in Taiwan, but they were somewhat frustrated that the White House pushed through this normalization process without taking in uh, Congress, at least not enough uh, seen from, from the Congress. Uh, and they uh, uh, then pushed through this uh, Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, of course, the, the history is much more complex than that, but it is really driven by the, by the US uh, Congress. And the important thing from the Taiwan Relations Act is this uh, uh, um, thing that it, uh, that it says that a uh, US president should ensure Taiwan has the ability to defend itself. So this is, I guess, what uh, President Biden is referring to when he says that we are committed to that. Um, but there's a commitment is maybe taking it too far, but at least they, they has this, that, that, that the Taiwan has the ability to defend itself, uh, whether that commits the US to go in militarily to assist uh, Taiwan with US forces uh, uh, is what is being discussed, uh, uh, but which you could really, um, yeah, which you could really argue for a long time. And then there is a lot of extra a lot of extra uh, documents uh, that you that the US and China has agreed on, uh, especially in the 1980s, uh, as they continue to 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 negotiate uh, these uh, these developments, uh, negotiate their relationship, um, and uh, and I think the important one from the six assurances uh, from 2082 was this uh, about the US saying that they don't take any position on the. On the, uh, regarding the serenity over Taiwan, but they insist on a peaceful resolution. So in that way, it also belongs to or relates to the, to the, to the important thing from the Ta Taiwan Relations Act about ensuring that Taiwan has the ability to defend itself. So the key point is that Taiwan shouldn't be forced to something that they do not want to do. Um, so this complex set of agreements, domestic law, promises, uh, there's a lot of inconsistency, there's a lot of uh, contradictions in it. But this has led to uh, what we often term and what they also term themselves, this strategic ambiguity policy from, from the US. And this is being discussed a lot now. So I used uh, spent some time on just uh, elaborating on how I see this strategic uh, ambiguity and why I would definitely uh, uh, not argue for going uh, towards more strategic clarity, because in many ways, as I write here in the end, this strategic um, uh, ambiguity has actually played a significant role in ensuring the stability in the Taiwan Strait since normalization of relations in the, in, in the 1970s. Uh, and it, it, it has, because it has this double deterrence and double reassurance. It, it, uh, it deters China. The, the key in the US policy is to deter China from using military force to coerce Taiwan into uh, unification, but also to deter Taiwan from declaring formal independence. Uh, maybe you remember uh, way back when Bush, uh, in the White House, Bush was in the White House and he said, you know, oh, he, um, uh, at some point when Chen Shui-bian was in power in Taiwan, he was really furious with the way that he was challenging the status quo and said that now Taiwan needs to calm down. Um, so, so there's also been this uh, continuous effort uh, previously to, to deter Taiwan from declaring uh, formal independence. So a double deterrence but also a double reassurance. 
So reassure China that the US does not support Taiwan uh, formal in the, uh, independence and reassure Taiwan that the US will not allow China to take uh, Taiwan by military force. So, uh, so what we are seeing, I, I would argue, with this push for strategic clarity is that we are moving to single deterrence and single reassurance. So single deterrence, we only need to deter uh, China. Reassuring, we only, or US, only needs to uh, reassure uh, Taiwan. And this, I think, is part of the problem and part of, not the problem, but part of the tension, uh, uh, explaining the tension growing uh, in, the, in the Taiwan Strait. Because what have we seen from the US in recent years? Uh, this builds especially on a recent article by uh, Ryan Hash from the RAND Corporation. He simply makes a rundown of developments in, uh, in uh, US-Taiwan policy in recent years. It's a really good kind of uh, overview of, over recent developments. Uh, and, and this is uh, taken uh, from that. So we see a declining U.S. commitment to, to one China policy, a weakening of the U.S. strategy of, of strategic ambiguity. Here is some of the examples. We've seen that the U.S. have lifted restriction, restrictions on high-level visits and meetings between U.S. and Taiwanese official political leaders. There is this increase in high-level visits. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, uh, of course, comes into this uh, uh, list. Uh, but we see delegations from the U.S. Congress visiting uh, all the time, more or less. There uh, have been several visits since uh, the visit by Nancy Pelosi. Um, Pompeo is in Taiwan. Uh, yesterday he was, I don't know whether he's still there, but he's just been uh, back again. So, uh, second time this year, actually. So, there's a lot of U.S. visits uh, uh, all the time. And, uh, and we also see increased military ties and cooperation with, uh, with Taiwan. The U.S. weapon sales has increased. Uh, you're openly saying now that there are U.S. Marines uh, training uh, Taiwanese uh, military in Taiwan. Uh, so this is also, it started under the Trump administration, but apparently continued in the, uh, in the Biden administration. Um, we have uh, strengthened U.S. military presence around Taiwan. These routine uh, naval tra transits, the phone ups in the Taiwan Strait, uh, but also now that they are docking. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, on ta in, in Taiwan uh, uh, ports, which is also a newer, uh, uh, a newer development. Um, we have these increased references to Taiwan as a country in U.S. official reports. Uh, Taiwan is mentioned in a lot of meetings uh, uh, by the U.S. Uh, high-level uh, political and, and high-level po polit political and, and officials. Um, so. Uh, we have more uh, U.S. allies in Asia and Europe coming out in support. Um, and then, of course, we have these uh, mentioning by, by Biden, President Biden, on uh, referring to Taiwan as an ally and promising that the, the U.S. will defend Taiwan. So we had that. And all is this just to say that there is really a development in U.S. policy towards Taiwan. So we had this complex set of... Um, of uh, agreements, uh, this complex set of, uh, of, uh, of understandings, but now they are gradually being eroded. Uh, and of course, uh, you could argue, as I often do, that it's, uh, it's an unavoidable result of tensions and mistrust between the US and China. And the way that in the US, China is seen as the main rival, the main threat. Um, and then all these things, it's simply difficult. As there's no trust, you can't really uphold these, uh, these agreements. But I think it's important also to see that there is actually a development in the U.S.-Taiwan policy. Of course, then we can turn to, to the development in the, China pol in the Chinese policy. Um, and we have, uh, and this is, of course, you could argue the, the, the main driver behind all these developments, and it's going back uh, uh, decades, uh, or at least one decade, is that now China is seriously stepping into this role, uh, uh, has a stronger, as this great power role, has a stronger economic, political, and military uh, uh, strength. Uh, and of course, this plays into the balance uh, in the strait, so it would, it would also erode the agreements, because they were built at another time when you had another China and you had another US, you had another Taiwan. So things, just to say, it's always been in movement, but now there is 
these extra movements because uh, of this development uh, in, uh, with, uh, in China and the balance between China and the US. So the military balance in the Taiwan Strait has tipped to, to China, China's uh, advantage. Um, the Chinese economy uh, now being linked up with all the regional state, of course, that gives them more tools, you could say in the toolbox that they can use. Uh, uh, in relation to also pushing for the regional states to uh, to stay with their uh, one China policies, um, to 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 punish, to deter Taiwan and, and states uh, supporting Taiwan, as we saw uh, also uh, in the most recent crisis, where they rather quickly stopped uh, Taiwanese uh, uh, export to to the mainland uh, and also uh, had other you could call them economic instruments that they put in uh, in play. We often hear at this about a more confident China, and I'm, I'm sure we can come to argue, uh, uh, or we can come to discuss. I, I agree, we see a more confident China in a lot of diff in a lot of cases, but I'm not sure we're seeing it in relation to Taiwan. I think a lot of what we are seeing the, the Chinese do is actually very much reacting. They are really seeing that they are under pressure. Uh, that, that they see the U.S., as I mentioned, moving away from the one China policy, that they're seeing forces in Taiwan that are pressuring for independence. So they are reacting to, again, this window that is closing more than they try to force the window more open. Um, and uh, so therefore, as I, as I write here, majority of Chinese efforts are focused on preventing support for Taiwan, for Taiwanese uh, independence, rather than promoting uh, uh, support for, for unification. Uh, what have we seen the Chinese uh, do? Uh, uh, well, as we clearly saw under the, the crisis early August, uh, the military presence, uh, uh, the military activities <coughs> are increased. Um, so I, I'll get back to saying a bit more on the crisis and what we saw uh, in the military exercise, what kind of military exercises we saw. But this was, my point here is this was already happening long before Nancy Pelosi set foot on Taiwan. So we, as, as this uh, graph show you, this is the Chinese uh, planes flying into uh, Taiwan's air defense identification zone, uh, going back from uh, January 2021. Uh, and stopping before the crisis, but already here you're seeing big uh, spikes. So this was already happening before uh, the, the most recent uh, crisis. We also see increased uh, what I call uh, political diplomatic efforts to squeeze international space for Taiwan. Um, this has also been going up and down over the years. Uh, sometimes the Chinese has been willing to allow more international space for Taiwan. When Ma Ying Zhou was uh, was uh, uh, was uh, from the KMT was uh, uh, president on Taiwan, well, then they were more flexible, more uh, open to having t uh, uh, more international space for Taiwan. But now, with the uh, Taiwan and uh, the DPP, they are clearly trying to squeeze uh, this uh, international space. Again, this was also happening before uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit, but I expect it to be really, really. Uh, uh, in, uh, in focus for China now. They will push even more for, for this now uh, following the, the visit because they, um, yeah, they really see that this is, they see, a, seen from China again, a dangerous uh, trend where more and more European uh, uh, and American delegations are coming to Taiwan, also pushing for having a, a stronger representation by Taiwan in international institutions. Um, and this they really want to close down. So I think we saw it already before, but I think we'll see more of this uh, uh, now. Uh, increasingly use these uh, economic tools. Um, uh, uh, the whole uh, this this is also uh, uh, something we've seen seen uh, previously, but we'll continue to see uh, the strengthened disinformation influence campaigns directed towards Taiwan. Uh, is also something we've seen before using, again, these very commercialized Taiwanese media to push for uh, de trying to delegitimize uh, the DPP, uh, different uh, Tsai uh, especially, but different uh, groups that the Chinese uh, uh, see are pushing for more uh, pro-independence stand uh, in Taiwan. Uh, and simply, you could say, delegitimizing the Taiwanese political system in many ways. Uh, so they are trying to push uh, with these different uh, campaigns, what we sometimes call gray zone or hybrid, uh, uh, 
hybrid uh, uh, activities. Uh, this is not again something new, uh, but uh, but of course uh, uh, we 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 see it more now when we are more focused. The Taiwanese are more. The Americans are more focused on it. Good. So then we get to the, the, the crisis uh, uh, that we had here uh, early August. And all the things I've said so far is kind of leading up to my main point that I also think I mentioned in the beginning, that this was somehow unavoidable. Of course, the Nancy Pelosi visit was kind of the trigger, but we would have had a crisis and we'll have a crisis again. Because all these uh, dynamics, all these movements that we see in the U.S.-Taiwan policy, we see the development in Taiwan, and we see the development in U.S.-China relation. And of course, that China is growing stronger relative to the U.S. economically, military, especially uh, militarily, if we look at the, at, at the region. So it's not that China can compete with the U.S. in Africa and around the world, but in the region, the Chinese military is now seriously challenging the U.S. military, of course, especially uh, in the Navy, uh, in, because this is a maritime uh, setting. So especially the Chinese um, Navy is now seriously able to challenge the, the U.S. Navy. So this would have, have uh, happened, I would argue, uh, uh, anyway, uh, or at some point, and we'll, we'll see it again. But this uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi visit was uh, the trigger. And, uh, and the, the, the visit by Nancy Pelosi was, was, was um, announced already in the spring, and it was canceled uh, due to her getting COVID, uh, I think it was. Uh, but because it was announced already, the Chinese had a long time to kind of prepare and, and at least uh, also try to warn. So they sent a lot of warnings uh, to the US that this would definitely not be a, a good idea, that this would definitely jeopardize stability in the strait, jeopardize uh, US-China relations. Uh, but seen from China, there was no willingness to listen. There was no willingness to go into any kind of dialogue. Uh, they didn't really accept the, the argument from the Biden administration that this was a Congress thing and the Biden administration couldn't really interfere. Um, so therefore, I think that the Chinese uh, reaction was well prepared and it was also uh, very strong, uh, the Chinese reaction. So if we look at this uh, map, uh, it shows you the red lines or the, the, these orange red ones shows you where they had the, the military exercises uh, areas uh, during this uh, crisis in, uh, in, in early August. And if you compare to the, re the most recent crisis in the mid-1990s, which is the gray areas, uh, it shows us most of all how, as I argued before, the military balance in the Taiwan Strait uh, has uh, shifted to China's advantage. Because now they are uh, able, confident, uh, to conduct uh, exercises all around the island, all around Taiwan. Um, and um, so, so location is one thing, that they have these uh, locations. But also if we look at, the, at what they used, they used the Navy, the Air Force, missiles, or the Strategic Rocket Force. So they used a lot of different capabilities and what the Chinese have been not very good at so far, but and, and we've also discussed a lot how good they are, is really to have these joint uh, military exercises where they use all their uh, uh, the, all the different navy, air force, uh, uh, and and their missile, uh, uh, the rocket force, and um, and and here they were actually tr exercising them uh, together. Uh, it's still difficult to um, to really judge how far they are, how good they are from this exercise. But at least we've seen that they are really working uh, on this uh, and, uh, and, um, and that it will change the situation, the military situation in, in the Taiwan Strait. Good, so this is the first thing. This one shows you uh, where they had their uh, launches, their missile launches. Uh, maybe not so clear, but uh, but they had around the the uh, the, the military the, the military exercise. If we kind of said uh, from beginning to end, lasted around seven days. But I, as I argue with the new normal, is that it's actually still ongoing and it will keep ongoing. So it's not that there will be a stop and we'll go back to before. 
uh, because now we've established kind of a new normal, so we'll continue. I wouldn't be surprised if we'll continue to see them doing these uh, missile launches, which is, as you can see here, the first time that we had uh, missiles fired that crosses over or goes over uh, Taiwan. Um, so this is uh, also um, a new thing. Good. Let's see if I have more here. So a lot of uh, military exercises that more or less demonstrated that the Chinese military is really um, a very different place today than in the last uh, big crisis we had in the mid-1990s. Um, we've seen especially the Chinese Navy now being able to operate further away from the Chinese coast and on the other side of Taiwan. So this uh, relates to what I in the beginning called the Chinese uh, aim to establish this uh, A2AD uh, capability, that it's actually the Chinese Navy, the Chinese Air Force, that's able to set up a control zone in the case of a military conflict. Of course, this doesn't mean that the, China, uh, that the US, as they did later in August, can't send the, the US uh, uh, Navy uh, uh, through the Taiwan Strait. So we have to, 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 um, to talk uh, or to separate between uh, how, how far we are in the spectrum of conflict. Because this A2AD capability gets more and more relevant the higher up we are in the conflict spectrum. Uh, and of course here we were very high, but it was still an exercise. But they demonstrated with this exercise that they are, uh, if not there, then very close to having this capability. But I'm sure we can talk more about it, but just in, uh, with time, I'll just say a bit on, on what I have called this uh, new normal, that we are kind of, uh, as I said, we're not going back to something before that we had before the crisis. That was also a very fluid uh, situation, but we're not going back there. We now have kind of a, a new normal established that is characterized by a higher level of security tension, military presence, military activities from all three, if not more. So it's the, Thai, it's the Chinese, it's the Americans, it's the uh, Taiwanese military that is also uh, uh, more and more present, more and more active. But it's also the Japanese military, the Australian military, the Canadian military recently had a, a frigate sailing through together with, with the US. And then we had several European countries also sending their warships to participate in these uh, freedom of navigation operations. So all in all, there is much more military uh, activity. And the problem with that is if you have no trust, you have no conflict mechanisms in place, the risk of an uh, accident, a coalition somehow, that that can escalate really fast. That risk is, is really growing. Uh, and that is the, the main concern. I'm, I, I, I don't see any of, of, of these three, and I guess that was my main point, presenting all this about not having a timeline, not using patience, and the US, of course, also being totally uh, preoccupied, you could say, with Ukraine and Russia. Nobody seeks to have a military conflict or war in the Taiwan Strait. But the problem is that all this is building up. And as long as there's no conflict mechanism uh, in place, it's a really dangerous situation. As, and as I see it, this, uh, this crisis in, in August, it undermined the last crisis mechanisms we had in place. So we had this about the median line or the, the, the line in the Taiwan Strait that kind of divided, this is Chinese, this is Taiwanese. We kind of, of course the Chinese never accepted it, but they kind of stayed with it, they followed it. So there was very seldom Chinese uh, planes and, and, and aircraft crossing. But now they'll do it all the time. As I write here, they will sail, fly and operate wherever it wants. Uh, so taking it from Kirby, uh, the uh, spokesperson from the, for, for, the, for the Biden administration, who also said in August uh, when, when the U.S. Uh, Navy sailed through the Taiwan Strait that they will sail, fly and operate whenever international law permits us to do so. Well, the Chinese will, <laughs> will, um, will si sail, fly and operate wherever it wants uh, uh, around, uh, in and around the Taiwan Strait. They will not follow any of these restrictions that were kind of never really formal restrictions, but it was a kind of understanding, again, 
this pragmatic management of the situation that we had between the US and China, this is breaking down. So this median line was one of them, this understanding that, uh, that you, you had a dialogue before visits, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's more surprises. Uh, and again, this uh, signaling, uh, political signaling, military signaling, because they're simply not really talking uh, together. There's no, no really um, mechanism, dialogue mechanisms in place. Um, so, um, so we have this new normal in the Taiwan Strait, much higher uh, level of tension and, and military presence activities and a very, uh, as I see it, very dangerous uh, situation. So, and and as with just ending up with, the, with future developments uh, and what is coming up, I think it will continue to, to flare up, to, to tension will continue to spike uh, in, in the coming years. It's somehow, as I said several times already, I guess it's, it's somehow unavoidable. But of course, the, 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 the outbreak of a military conflict is not unavoidable. But there is a real risk that it can, can, can simply because of this higher risk of, uh, of, in, of, uh, of um, coalitions or other things uh, uh, that, that, uh, that then can be uh, managed, that's difficult to, uh, to avoid escalating. So there is a, a grim outlook for, for the development. Uh, if you look at U.S.-China uh, relations and these growing tensions, uh, the Taiwan Strait is really where there is the biggest risk of a military conflict between uh, the two. So it is, is, is a, a, a big concern uh, and it requires careful management from, from all three sides that we are not really uh, seeing today. So the main risks is this misperception mistake, uh, uh, mistakes. Um, and if we look at, uh, I was also asked to look at what could cause, what could kind of, and of course we have elections, both in the US, uh, presidential elections, we have also elections in Taiwan, and every time there's elections, <laughs> we also have a risk, right? Uh, what, what, what can we imagine? I know it's a scary uh, scenario, but what is if Trump comes back? Um, I'm not sure he would go any certain direction in relation to, to Taiwan, even though he had some, uh, some, some uh, uh, policies that he pushed when he was uh, uh, president. But just this uncertainty that it would bring, it, not only uh, uh, in China and Taiwan, but also among the US allies in the region. Um, I mentioned Pompeo uh, being to going to Taiwan several times uh, uh, recent months. Uh, last time he was there, I don't know about this time, last time he was there, he argued for the US to establish formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Could be very, very dangerous, right? So these elections and the uncertainty about uh, elections, uh, uh, I'm, I, I don't see a more risk willing pro independence Taiwanese uh, uh, president or government coming up in 2000. And, and, uh, and, and, and 24. Uh, but there is a risk, of course. We don't, we don't know. There is no, at least as I see it, I don't see any strong candidate to take over from, from Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, so who will take over? What kind of president will we have on Taiwan? Will it be a, a, a stable, uh, able as she has been to really maneuver in this, uh, being not willing to compromise, but also not really rocking uh, the boat? Then there's also the risk of, um, of having uh, uh, an economic downturn in China. What will that mean for the, for the, uh, for, uh, for the Chinese policy uh, in China-US relations? Could it, uh, as we see uh, um, a lot of arguments generally when you talk about, you know, what is kind of the domestic legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party? Well, they're able to deliver economic growth. They're able to deliver uh, that China regains its great power position. If the economic growth pillar kind of weakens, will there be more of the nationalism pillar? Uh, and will it be more aggressive? So this is, of course, also uh, a concern that uh, that plays in. So I end out saying something, uh, destabilizing steps, watch to watch for. And, uh, and I actually, uh, some of this uh, uh, can seem very far off. This will never happen, right? At least if you've been working on Taiwan as long as I have, you'll say this will never happen. 
but I guess less and less certain, right? Because we are really seeing a lot of uh, uh, new things, things that you thought before, this will really never happen. And of course, I'm especially focusing on the plans for a visit by an acting US president to Taiwan. That would be a red line, right? Um, but also the US recognizing Taiwan as an independent state. This will also be a red line, again, seen from, seen from China. Uh, but also, if we see a public declaration, and this maybe we are already seeing, I'm not sure, and again here we can get back in, in discussion to talk about what is it actually we are seeing from the Biden administration. Is it a shift from this strategic uh, ambiguity towards strategic clarity? Um, uh, and, and, and how how will that influence the, the dynamics? Uh, it will at least not bring more uh, stability to, uh, to the Taiwan Strait, as I argued. But we could also see uh, new developments coming from China. They've just recently uh, 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 published their uh, white paper on Taiwan. Uh, they haven't published one for, for many years. So this is also a significant development. And there are new uh, wordings in this. It repeats a lot of their... Uh, their normal uh, uh, principles and, and stance uh, on Taiwan, a lot of what is in the 2005 uh, anti-secession law. Uh, but there's also so, something that's not there, uh, and especially this about allowing more uh, room for, for Taiwan after uh, this, in, within this one country, uh, two systems uh, principle. The two systems is, seems to be squeezed uh, a bit. So, uh, so, so there could be other initiatives coming from Taiwan that are oh, coming from China that could, uh, that could, uh, yeah, be things to watch out for that could also further destabilize the situation. New Chinese military routines. Um, a lot of the things we've seen in the crisis in August seems to be developing into being routines. So something they will do on a, on a regular basis. Uh, and there could be more of this, for example, also ways of trying to prevent uh, the U.S. Navy from making, uh, from conducting these freedom of navigation operations or making it more and more difficult. That could be also something to, uh, to, to watch out for, that this pragmatic uh, maneuvering and, and kind of, uh, of course, uh, protesting every time, but more or less just letting them sail, that this could, could uh, also uh, change any substantial steps towards a declaration of formal independence from the Taiwanese government would also really be a destabilizing step. Um, a lot of confidence, loss of confidence from the population in the Taiwanese government. This is something that's been discussed uh, in the literature. Uh, and I put it in here because uh, it seems very unlikely uh, now. Uh, but if we have a change of government in Taiwan, if there is more polarization, if there is more, you know, as we're seeing all over the world, uh, more uh, populism, uh, rising prices, uh, energy, food prices, etc. And this could be used also by uh, uh, China to, 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 uh, to make more uh, um, destabilizing uh, political situation in Taiwan. This is also something that could be one of these uh, uh, things to, to watch uh, out for. Good. So I kind of leave it there with uh, uh, maybe not so optimistic, positive uh, analysis of the way forward or the way that, that things will develop. I see uh, this crisis that we had in, uh, in early August as only uh, something that uh, gives us an indication of what will come in, in, in the coming years. And it really requires careful management, especially from the US and China. But I don't really see a lot of signs of that in the near horizon. And that is, I think, very worrying. 